Say the vat is good. The vat is good. Kiss the vat. Hey everybody, welcome to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy. Let's talk about the Rick and Morty The Vat of Acid episode and all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed. The show creator said that the opening of this episode is a tribute to Tim Burton's Batman movie. It just came from us loving Batman. And we were talking about what a staple vats of toxic waste were in the 80s. In that scene, Batman drops Jack Napier into a vat of acid, which turns him into Joker. The gangsters in this episode are even dressed in the same gothic style with fedoras and pinstripe suits. They almost look like Dick Tracy villains. As they're flying up to the plant, did you notice this rat? It sniffs the bones of another rat, dies, and then its bones are left for the next rat. This foreshadows both the bones floating in the vat of acid, but also the main plot of the episode, where Morty constantly replaces a dead Morty from another dimension in order to relive the same moments over and over. Also, Rick tries to impress Morty with his automatic parking, which quietly sets the entire character character conflict into place. Uh-huh. Well, I thought it was cool. Rick spends the episode trying to win Morty's approval. Rick is exchanging red crystals for blue ones. And this dialogue, I'll make lots of money with these. I'll make lots of those with these. Also foreshadows the story. The controller Rick creates uses a red button and a blue button to constantly remake the time stream. Or so we think. This season has been even more meta than usual, with the episode never ricking Morty being a meditation on Dan Harmon's story circle writing process. We did a whole video on that if you want to check that out. And this episode also seemed like a writer's room discussion pouring out onto the screen. I'm constantly pitching you ideas, Rick. Interesting choice of meeting place, Rick. You like it. My grandson had notes. Come on. Even having Rick and Morty stuck at the bottom of a vat of acid seems like a corner the writers painted themselves into. All of us were like, this idea is incredibly stupid. The funniest thing we could do is try to make it a whole episode. If there's something stupid about this idea with the bones floating up, okay, well, make the story about whether or not it's stupid. <laughs> like, imagine Rick and Morty are the writers of this episode, which they kind of are. They drive all the action. Rick is the head writer who always shoots down Morty's ideas. So Morty finally rebels. Vat of fake acid? Acid? Are you dying of dementia? How are you talking to me like this? But this whole episode was just a ploy by the head writer, Rick, to show why Morty's story idea wouldn't work. I don't do time travel. It's not time travel. It's saving a place in time. Oh my God. It's Rick famously hates time travel stories, which I'll talk about at the end of this video. I love how in Rick and Morty, even the smallest story details always seem to support the main plot. For instance, the way of faking your own death with a vat of acid is a way of creating a do-over, which is what this entire episode is about. And later, Morty's teacher talks about falling in love, living in a fake past, meaning the Renaissance Fair, learning a skill, and then suffering the consequences, in this case an STD. This is exactly what happens to Morty. He falls in love, has adventures in a past that turns out to be fake, he learns about himself, and then he suffers the consequences. Rick calls Morty Bukowski, a reference to Charles Bukowski, a grizzled old postal worker who did some writing on the side. He also references past episodes where Morty got a dragon and Rick was a pickle. I'm Pickle Rick! They argue about concepts for the episode, and Morty rings up a device that will reload your life like a video game. And then go back to your save point. Yes, Morty, I saw it on Futurama. Oh, He's referring to the final episode of Futurama called Meanwhile, where the professor invents the time button, which lets you relive the past 10 seconds. In that episode, Fry and Leela live a whole life together that is erased just like Morty and his girlfriend in this episode. Notice that Rick's device is modeled after that time button. When Rick goes to work, he puts on goggles that make him look just like his inspiration, Doc Brown. The sound effect used by the device is from the load screen of Star Wars Battlefront, which I have heard thousands of times. The song in the first half of this montage is It's in the Way That You Use It by Eric Clapton. The song was written for the soundtrack of The Collar of Money, a pull shark comeback movie that's all about second chances, just like Morty is constantly giving himself second chances in this episode. I laughed real hard when Morty used the device in an actual video game, instead of just using the safe point in the game. Also, notice this villain is using the same Gatling gun that we saw in the opening story of The Never Ricking Morty. Also, the sequence where he chickens out on the high dive could be a callback to The Never Ending Story too. This cop has a Shoney's mug, which is a big hint that all of this is just a ruse Rick is putting on for Morty. In the Rick Shank Rick Demption, he fools a government interrogator by inventing a memory inside of a Shoney's. And right here you can see that the theater is playing ball fondlers, which we saw a trailer for in the episode Interdimensional Cable. This bar has the punny name of Poor Decisions, and the exterior of it looks a lot like Moe's Tavern in The Simpsons. Appropriate since most Springfield businesses have funny pun names. What did you do? You killed oh The Simpsons, God. Morty! No, no. 
Hey, uh... Morty is hanging out outside of a porn shop and notice that they only sell used books and movies. Ew. Hey man, got a big box of porn for you. And then he meets the love of his life, who has no name, and we see their relationship evolve in a montage, much like the opening of Up. When they're suffering relationship problems, they're filmed from above and at an angle, much like this iconic shot in the breakup movie, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Another story about reliving your life to correct your mistakes. The plane crash sequence is actually not written. One of the biggest heroes of it is the director, because the episode was five minutes short on his own accord he just did that whole extended plane crash sequence it was inspired by the movie alive which is based on the true story of the uruguayan rugby team that resorted to cannibalism in order to survive a plane crash just like morty and his party beforehand they were eating vegan shoe leather a reference to this famous sequence in chaplin's the gold rush and notice this passenger has on a beanie that looks just like stan marsh's from south park this is a possible reference to the way that show constantly resurrects kenny the way morty is resurrected in this episode i'm not sure if the wolves leave him alone because he frightens them with his spirit or because he's all frostbitten and gross. If you have any thoughts, let me know in the comments. For me, the pivotal moment in this episode is when Morty refuses to reset time. He would rather live having loved than risk losing everything. This is when he learns the moral that he shares with Rick later on. I laughed at this coma get well balloon that says, I hope you wake up. After committing suicide by Harambe, he learns his final lesson that life needs consequences. We are who we are because of consequences. You can't live without consequences, you know? And by the way, this gorilla is secretly a character that's appeared in the background of every Rick and Morty episode. That's your mom. Mother? When Rick reveals the truth, he says, Jack, I don't respect time travel. If Ant-Man and the Wasp can do it, I'm not interested. And there's a few end jokes here. Jeff Loveness co-wrote this episode, and he's just been hired to write Ant-Man 3. The Russo brothers have worked closely with Dan Harmon over the years, directing and producing several episodes of Community. Bulk of the series. They, of course, directed Avengers Endgame, which involved a time travel plot. Both Rick and Dan Harmon hate time travel stories. The only time travel episode of Rick and Morty, Rattlestar Galactica, was mostly used to prove that time travel stories suck. Also, that's about as much curvature as you're going to get from a time travel story. This is also why there's an unused box of time travel stuff on the shelf in the garage. Rick has no use for it. But it turns out that Morty was just replacing other versions of himself in other dimensions. That's right, you little bitch. It's the prestige. You in that film, Hugh Jackman is a magician. Sorry, illusionist who dies at the end of every performance and replaces himself with a copy. The end credits tag with Johnny Carson shows impervious Acid Man repeating the structure of the illusion from The Prestige. We see glimpses of several brutal Morty deaths in this scene. Most of them are shown in the episode, but a few are new. Here he's drinking potions, on a date with Jessica, hijacking Rick's spaceship, actually buying the ice cream that he sampled earlier, and binging on something in front of the fridge. The protest signs at the end are ripped straight from the headlines. There's Moscow Morty, a play on Moscow Mitch. That's our word, like Morty said a slur on TV, Return the Whales, a play on Save the Whales that I think is a reference to Star Trek IV when the Enterprise crew traveled back in time to steal whales. Cannibalism is a choice, a play on abortion or gay rights protesters, and also to the cannibalism that Morty committed earlier in the episode. And finally, safe space is greater than blackface because of all the politicians who we discovered wore blackface in their errant youths. The episode ends with Justice Sotomayor quoting Portia's monologue from The Merchant of Venice when she appeals to Shylock for mercy. This is a fancy way of saying that Morty death moves the crowd to mercy and they forgive him. Well guys, that's all the Easter eggs that I found. Let me know what you thought of the episode in the comments below. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.